Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. Today on Central Booking, Edgar Award-winning annotator and editor extraordinaire Leslie S. Klinger. Les's most recent work is the new annotated Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, published by the Mysterious Press. Called the definitive version of Robert Louis Stevenson's classic, the book, about man, monster, madness, and murder, boasts an introduction by Joe Hill and more than 150 color images throughout. The project is grounded by Klinger's insightful commentary, which adds context and color to a story that's been ingrained in the public consciousness since its publication in 1886. Les, who holds the distinction of being the world's first consulting Sherlockian, holds an AB in English from the University of California and earned a degree from their school of law. He continues to practice by day, specializing in tax, estate planning, and business law. An expert in Victorian literature, he has previously annotated works including Dracula, Frankenstein, and Sherlock Holmes, as well as the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft. Klinger's contributions to more contemporary titles include Neil Gaiman's Sandman and American Gods, as well as Alan Moore and David Gibbon's classic graphic novel Watchmen. The new annotated Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde continues that tradition of excellence. Publishers Weekly gave the book a starred review, noting, Klinger makes reading or rereading this masterpiece an immersive experience. Richly illustrated with scenes from Victorian London, playbills, and film images, this will instantly become the definitive edition of this complex and influential piece of literature. Now, settle in for a bit of cerebral sleuthing as we're on the case, indeed the strange case, of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with Leslie S. Klinger. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Central Booking. I am excited to be in virtual conversation tonight with the esteemed Leslie S. Klinger, who now brings us the new annotated strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is coming out just in time for Halloween, which seems- Just in time, just in time. And you, you got it, all those words in the title. It's the longest title I've ever done, but it's the way, you know, hey, gotta, gotta go with the original. You know, it, it tells you what it is. And I have to say the hardest part of that was not saying the strange case. Right. Of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> yeah, it's those simple little things that throw me off, but you just expect it to be there. Um, but I wanted to sort of start, I guess, probably with the obvious here. I'm wondering if what speaks to you personally about this specific book, and then moving away from that, can you also tell me why you think it is that this has become, you know, such an indelible part of the public consciousness? Well, I mean, they're tied together, John. I mean, the, the reason that the book appealed to me as a subject is the very fact that it's become iconic, that, that the public has embraced it and adapted it over and over and over and over again. Uh, those are the kinds of books that interest me when I do these annotation projects. Um, and yes, Jekyll and Hyde has a very deep history of that. Uh, when it appeared in 1886, it was a, actually a reasonably commercial, a successful commercial venture. It came out as a, quote, shilling shocker, um, uh, which is to say as a paperback. Um, and it, it sold very briskly and was widely reviewed. Uh, it was reviewed not only in a number of publications, but also from the pulpit, from uh, public forums. You know, it was a sort of a very controversial book in that regard. And almost immediately, it became the subject of public discussion and public copying. Uh, there was a stage production very early on. And this was very common, by the way, that authors would get ripped off by somebody who would just put their book on the stage without bothering to license the work. Um, but the, the public quickly embraced the story. And not only did it go through a number of stage productions, but uh, in the film era, it went through a number of film productions. I mean, there, there are dozens of films that have been made of Jekyll and Hyde at this point. Uh, so that interested me. Why? What is it about this book that the public found so fascinating? Sure. And, you know, I was telling you before we started recording that this, oddly enough, was my first introduction to the book. I'm 40 years old. You know, I know what a Jekyll and Hyde personality is. And yet 
I hadn't read the actual story, and what a great excuse to do so. Um, well, that's not that that doesn't surprise me because, of course, it's the same with Dracula, the same with Frankenstein. Those are the things everybody and and even Sherlock Holmes. People assume they know them; they know what those books are about, and then they read them and they find out, oh, this is considerably different from what I thought. Uh, it's nothing like the movie. <laughs> You know, no, it's no, nothing like the stage play, uh, <laughs> or it's it's not nothing, nothing like, but it's very it's dissimilar. There are great differences between the adaptations and the real thing, um, and that too interests me to see that sort of process of of I don't even know how to describe it compression, uh, winnowing, adaptate simplification. What happens to these great books? Frankenstein is always a tremendous surprise to people who are used to the, you know, the castle on the hill, the creature being uh, struck by a lightning bolt and then terrorizing the village. You know, none of that happens in the book. Uh, and, uh, and, and Dracula, you know, there's not some guy uh, dressed like a lounge lizard, uh, you know, with an opera cape running around and, and so on. So, these distortions have permeated um, our views of the stories. And Jekyll and Hyde is definitely one of those. So, I mean, you know, it's not a lot like the uh, the Jerry and the, the Tom and Jerry version or the, uh, uh, let's see, um, I'm trying to think of some of the funny titles. There's a Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde is one of the better ones. Um, there's, a, there's unexpurgated versions. Uh, you know, and so on. So there's been a lot of distortions. Sure. So, you know, let me ask you about that because, you know, obviously there's sort of this pop culture um, reverence for Jekyll and Hyde, and we all get what that means in terms of somebody's personality, but what do you think is perhaps most misunderstood or misrepresented for people who haven't actually experienced the story itself, but have seen it in some other iteration? Well, I think what they've misunderstood is that Stevenson's point really was the universality of this. We are all Jekyll and Hyde. We all have inside us, not terrible evil, but but what what he called that old war of the members, the conflicting influences, you know, that our better angel and our darker angel and trying to wrestle for control. And uh, as one critic uh, said about the, the book, you know, the great shock is not that Jekyll and Hyde uh, are two separate people, but that, that they are one person. Um, and so that's really, that's really the, the center of the story. And it's what make, makes it universal. That, that idea that we still have the same issues today. It has nothing to do with chemistry or uh, uh, bad science or anything like that. It's about owning up to who we really are and reconciling uh, the disparate aspects of our personalities. Uh, in the story, there's a lot of ambiguity about Dr. Jekyll. Uh, by the way, I should just for fun point out that Stevenson said it was to be pronounced G kill. Oh. Nobody says that, but, <laughs> but Stevenson said that was the proper way to pronounce it. That was the Scottish way. So, um, but but uh, the we don't understand. We don't really know what is it that Jekyll is hiding, repenting from. Uh, we don't really know what Hyde's terrible sins have been, other than that he kills Sir Danver Carew. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity. Is this about sex? Is it about um, homosexuality? Is it about prostitution and, and uh, abuse of women? We don't know. Uh, there's a lot of hints. It's an interesting book, of course, in that unlike the movies, there are essentially no women in the story whatsoever. Right. Um, Whereas the movies have all made this a great romantic story. There's a good woman who Jekyll is uh, typically engaged to and Hyde comes into the picture, etc. But a lot of different versions of the story. But that's not in the book. We don't really know. And so because we don't know, 
it gains a universality. Um, we can imagine whatever secrets we want for Jekyll and, and take it to ourselves. We can take it personally then. Yes, I too have things of, of myself that I need to reconcile, that I need to deal with. Um, so it, it's, it's very different from the, from the original story, from the, from the adaptations, yes. Sure. And I think that, you know, that's a great point that I found myself relating to as I read the book. And I, I liked the ambiguity because, as you said, you know, a lot of things are left up to your imagination and perhaps your demons become his demons, whereas in a more visual forum, all those blanks are kind of filled in for you. So Exactly. Exactly. Know, sure. And so it's interesting. And I did want to ask you, you know, about the process of annotation as well, because I assume it is kind of an art form and it can be almost like going down the rabbit hole because there is so much information. Yes. You know, you've done this more than a few times now. Yes. So I'm wondering what is that process like for you? How does it begin and how do you keep it from becoming something that overwhelms you? Well, the first step is to select um, a work that excites you because you you're going to spend a lot of time with it. <laughs> So it needs to be something that you're willing to read multiple times because that's what you end up doing. Um, and then you read it really slowly and constantly ask yourself questions. I mean, the first time I do this, I put in what I call dummy footnotes, just blank, just drop in note numbers at all the places that I know I've got a question. Most readers are going to have a question. What does that word mean? What's going on here? Um, you know, and so on. So then I'm going to go back and try and fill those in. Then I read. I read not just the story, but I try and read everything I can that has been done by other scholars looking at the text. I'm not an English major. You know, I was an English major, but I'm not an academic. So this isn't um, deconstructionism. I'm not looking to analyze the great biblical themes, et cetera. If there's one mentioned, I'm going to talk about it. But uh, I, I'm, I'm more interested in, as you said it before, enhancing the reader's experience to, to show them things that maybe they missed when they read it themselves, which is why I say always, you should read this without the notes first, because inevitably, there have to be spoilers. There has to be spoilers because part of my job is to show you, hey, here's where this thing at the end got set up here uh, and point that out. And so there are inherently spoilers in doing a, a good job of annotating. Um, I read other annotated editions. And, and these days with, with eBooks, um, there are dozens of cheap annotated editions of almost every classic. I mean, somebody decides they can make money by taking some public domain story, dropping some footnotes in, and then publishing it as an ebook for a dollar or two dollars or whatever. Um, so I, I try and read some of those to at least see what other commentators have thought were worthy of noting. And obviously, I learned things in the process as well. Um, I have, as you can see, a, a lot of books. I have a ton of resources with regard to Victoriana, um, an 1888 Britannica, 1910 Britannica, a whole bunch of Baedecker travel guides, almanacs, medical texts, et cetera, that I love to use because I'm always trying to help us understand the context. I always say we don't speak Victorian English. So... Um, there needs to be a certain amount of just glossary in these books. What does it mean when somebody says this or that? What is the social custom that they're talking about? Whether it's a visiting card or, or uh, uh, even things like the Victorian laws about wills. Uh, wills become an important subject here. So, uh, so I'm always looking for context. So part of the process is ask myself a whole bunch of questions and then try and find answers. And in the process of finding answers, I usually come up with a lot more questions. Um, one, of the, one of the joys of doing what I do is I, I have many friends who write fiction and we all agree that the research is the best part of the process of writing. But for fiction writers, the, 
the golden rule is that you need to throw away 80 or 90 percent of your research because you can't just dump information into a work of fiction and have it be um enjoyable right i throw away nothing <laughs> so no I, I do try and use a certain amount of selectivity part of which is trying to gauge sort of the audience but but sometimes you know i realize that there are things that i shouldn't assume about the audience for example uh, uh, you know, I annotated uh, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' brilliant uh, Watchmen, and um, I realized as I was doing it that I needed to write footnotes explaining what was the Vietnam War, who is Richard Nixon, you know, this is now ancient history, this is 50 years ago now, so more than 50 years ago for the beginnings of the Vietnam War. And so there are a lot of people who did not live through it and don't know those things. So some of it is sort of, as I said, sort of gauging the audience and figuring out what information I should put in and what to leave out, so. Sure, and it's interesting too, because a book like this, you know, and on the one hand, you think it might appeal to a very specific audience, but it also can have a really broad readership, not just, you know, historians or scholars, but people like me who are coming to a story for the first time and who really want that context. Um, but something else I found in a book like this is, you know, a lot of maybe creatives or writers or people who like to deconstruct uh, the creative process, because in this book, you know, you actually sort of get multiple texts. There's, you know, a yes. notebook version, there's a printer's version, there's, you know, strikeouts, right. the alternate word choice. So I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind talking about that aspect of the book, too, because I found that really sure. kind of intriguing. Well, I, I do, too, John. I find that fascinating. Um, and so I've been lucky when in the, in the choices of the, of the things that I've annotated that, that there are earlier versions. For example, um, again, I mentioned Watchmen. Uh, Dave Givens gave me Alan Moore's script. So for a 22-page comic book, Alan would typically produce a 110-page script. So there's a wealth of materials or background and, and backstories and, and, and debates about uh, the things that actually got onto the printed page. Um, when I did the Sherlock Holmes stories, um, and I'm gonna talk about Dracula in a second, um, I looked at as much as I could, the manuscripts of the stories. Um, there are only 37 manuscripts sort of known out of the 60 stories. But even so, those are fascinating to see sort of what changed over uh, over the process. Now, Dracula was a very special treat because I had read that the manuscript of Dracula existed and had been sold at auction. And I tracked down the owner of the of the manuscript. It turned out to be the billionaire Paul Allen, who had bought it. And he allowed me to come up to Seattle and spend a few days going through the manuscript page by page. Now, it's a type script. So what we have on the type page, um, and I'm not sure whether there was a handwritten beginning to it or whether Stoker dictated it to a typewritist, but on this page, on this type page, first of all, there are extensive handwritten changes. Stoker's handwriting, the handwriting of the editor at the publisher, and his brother's notes on it because he sent the manuscript to his brother, who was a doctor, for comments on the medical aspects. So out in the margins, there are sort of like long paragraphs about what was right or wrong about something that Stoker said. In addition, and this was the coolest thing, um, there are cut and pasted sections where literally Stoker took a piece of paper and pasted it over part of the text and new material was typed on top of it. And by holding the page up to the light, you could read what was underneath it and see what material had been cut out uh, and changed. And so I was able to talk a great deal about the changes of that text, which, which was a lot because the book was written over a long period of time and Stoker had a lot of ideas that sort of he played with and then got rid of. Um, or or incorporated. Um, when I did uh, Neil Gaiman's American Gods, Neil dug out for me his handwritten first drafts of, of the book. 
Uh, and I was able to see those and, and go through that and compare it to the first published edition. Then there was an expanded published edition and so on. I love to do that for the very reason that you talked about, namely um, because of the craft, because I think that writers um, and people who want to learn about writing are or should be interested in seeing how these brilliant authors have edited their own work because mm -hmm. everybody knows the mantra, writing is rewriting, so. Sad, but true. <laughs> and, you know, it's absolutely fascinating. And in reading this book, I kept finding myself thinking about, you know, the convenience of computers is great, but how much do you lose? How much will we never know? What is just out there in the ether that we will never see in print? So to go I understand. Ho hopefully hard. authors save multiple versions. Um, on, but, uh, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I faced this myself in a very humble way when I, uh, the University of Minnesota has a, the largest Sherlock Holmes collection in the world. And early on, they said to me, could we have the manuscript of your Sherlock Holmes book? And I said, sure, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, do, you want, do you want discs with the, because I did do that. I would save, you know, I, this is a lawyerly habit to save, versions uh, but i ended up printing them all out so they have you know five different versions some of them with handwritten changes and corrections and all that not that any scholar is ever going to care but in any event it is it is a fascinating problem for librarians these days uh, but sometimes the joys get diminished uh, i when i was doing frankenstein i was very excited because i knew that the bodleian um, in in oxford had uh, Mary Shelley's notebooks, the, the very first drafts. And those are fascinating because they have interlineated Percy Shelley's mm -hmm. revisions, comments, suggestions, etc. And I said to my wife, this is great. We're going to go to England and I'm going to spend days at the Bodley and going through this. Son of a gun, they digitized it. So I didn't have to leave my, my office to... to to do that. I still went through it, but I got to do it sitting in front of a computer. Yeah, it's so interesting, you know, what changes and what doesn't. And I'm going to digress for a moment, but I have to tell you, I was <laughs> recording with the Book Cougars last night, and I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're a podcast. And one of the Book Cougars is Chris Wolak, and she is an unrepentant Dracula fan. So I promised her that this is going to be the year that I read Dracula. Um, Seems appropriate after Jekyll and Hyde, Jekyll. Um, and so she asked me who I was interviewing next and I told her it was gonna be you and she completely geeked out because you know she's such a lover of Dracula and very much familiar well, with your annotated edition, so. It was, it was that book was so much fun to do um, because for many reasons, one of them being, look, Sherlock Holmes is something that I, people say, how long did you take to write it? And I say 37 years, you know, I started, out as a Sherlockian um, in law school and got around to starting to work on it uh, many, many years later. But uh, Dracula, I had read in college, but I had never thought about writing about it and sort of started cold. So I really immersed myself in it and got back into that. And it's just, and, I, and of course I loved it because he's exactly contemporary with Sherlock Holmes. Um, you can imagine Dracula and Holmes walking the streets of London and bumping into one another. Uh, right. And so actually, I'm going to move into a different area for a moment, if you don't mind. So I'm going to hold up just a printout of the book cover. It's, you know, very, very attractive. Um, I actually read this book in PDF format because physically it's not available yet. It will be when people see this interview. I think it comes out on the 18th, which is yes. very, very soon. Um, but I think that sometimes, you know, get people get the wrong idea about annotation and they think that it might be, you know, very dense. But this book is fully illustrated, lots of color, incredible graphics. And I'm wondering if you can talk about those and how you think that sure. the text to, again, make that really... Well, that's that's the most fun for me always is assembling the pictures. And um, so here, not only... I mean, there were two principal sources. And you're right. I mean, this book is so full of color. Uh, and by the way, I want you to buy the hardcover because it's so beautiful. But if you really want to look at the images carefully, 
You should also buy the ebook because on the ebook you can blow up the images and they're very high res resolution, uh, high very high resolution reproductions of the images. So the the images fall into really three categories. One category, which is common to all of my books, is pictures of things, people, places, etc., just so that people can get more out of knowing who somebody is that's an historical figure referred to or an actual location referred to and so on. But second here, this book has been illustrated almost from day one. Um, and so there are many, I've lost count of how many, public domain editions of illustrated editions of the book. So I have reproduced probably 60 or 70 illustrations drawn from the text. Um, and it's interesting, interesting to see how different artists have interpreted the same scene. And, and one page, for example, I've got three different artists doing exactly the same scene, and they're very different ideas. But the third great well of images here is the pop culture side of things, stage, screen, and comic books. So I have dozens of stills from movies, posters from movies, comic book covers, uh, stage play scenes, uh, lobby cards, etc. just because they're so beautiful and they really um, make it more fun to read. So yes, this is a heavily illustrated work. I think there's 160 illustrations or something like that. Yeah, it's great. It's so comprehensive. There's so much you know, to look at. And like you said, I love seeing, you know, some of the same scenes um, rendered through different illustrators at different times because it's the same source material, but what you right. get, you know, looks completely different, which is... Or the movie version right. um, in some cases. And uh, I'm sure the comic book covers will be a surprise to people to see that uh, we have Batman meeting uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, sort of. We have the Marvel Mr. Hyde. And of course, we have Classics Illustrated editions. Uh, I think there are three separate Classics Illustrated issues of Jekyll and Hyde. So different covers, different writers. Sure. And so I will shortly move into broader territory and then I will let you get back to your evening. I suspect I could talk to you all night, uh, but just a few more questions if you don't mind. And I did want to ask you about our author Stevenson, because so many people know him, you know, for writing sort of, you know, action stories for kids. Right. Poetry. Children's books, exactly. Yeah, so can you talk Treasure about Treasure Island? Him? Yeah, Treasure Island, of course. I remember that. I had that battered, beaten copy as a kid. And then to, you know, again, reconcile that with this, two very different things. But would you mind talking a bit about his background and what you think he drew on to, to fill out this story? What sure. Was really personal to him? Sure. Well, he was, he was um, originally destined to be an architect. And um, so he, his family expected him to do that. Um, he was going to be a designer of lighthouses, of all things. Uh, but uh, he wanted to be an artist. And uh, early on, he hung out with the artsy crowd, um, the art crowd at school. And like so many writers of that age, he, he eventually moved into that circle of writers that included uh, Stoker, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, um, uh, Rudyard Kipling, etc. They, many, they knew each other. Um, they shared uh, uh, social pastimes, They, when, especially when he went to London, um, and so on. And so he wanted to be a, a writer. Um, Treasure Island, I don't know that he conceived of it as a children's book. I think it it's become popular for children, but it's got a lot of adult material mm -hmm. in it, um, as does Kidnapped. And, of course, he wrote other uh, books of similar... Um, themes, if you will, but but depth, like The Master of Ballantrae um, uh, and, and so on, that, that were about his Scottish heritage and uh, explored that. But he also was an avid writer of short stories. You know, in those days, people didn't plop themselves into a, a genre and say, this is what I write. Arthur Conan Doyle is a perfect example of that. Um, yes, he wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories, but he also wrote historical romances. Uh, he wrote horror stories, supernatural fiction, all kinds of things. These people, these, these wonderful writers of the 19th century were storytellers. And it didn't matter to them what 
quote, genre they were writing in. Genres, I think, were really a, an invention of the 20th century um, publishers who found it easier to sell books by saying, this is a, uh, this is a horror right, uh, uh, novel, or this is a science fiction novel, or a mystery novel, or whatever. But you'll find when you, I mean, I found this to be true when I was putting together anthologies, that I would be put together a horror anthology and a detective fiction anthology, and I'd have some of the same writers in it, because they didn't care. So Stevenson wrote mysteries, and by the way, I mean I think Strange Case of is is the very deliberate title. It's a mystery. It's a murder mystery. Right. Who killed Sir Danvers Carew? Who is this mysterious Mister Hyde? And the detective lawyer Utterson um, has various suspects, but his friend Doctor Jekyll is not one of them, uh, and. So it's really laid out like a mystery, and um, and I think the public took it as that with almost sort of supernatural overtones, but not not really supernatural, but scientific. Uh, so, but Stevenson wrote other mystery stories as well, um, and he loved writing short stories. He wrote many short stories, uh, several collections, uh, New Arabian Nights and More New Arabian Nights are two brilliant collections of short stories of his. Um, including some fine detective fiction. They're very collectible for uh, for those who want to collect early mystery fiction. Um, so Jekyll and Hyde was a story he wanted to tell. I think that in part, it was a theme he had played with before. Um, he was fascinated from, from his youth with a figure known to uh, the community as Deacon Brody. So Deacon Brody was a respectable deacon of the church um, who by night led a gang of thieves. And this idea of the double life really interested Stevenson to the point where he and his friend William Henley, um, yes, the poet who wrote Invictus and lots of other stuff, uh, created a stage play called Deacon Brody. Uh, he also wrote short stories that, that sort of danced around the same theme. There's one called Markheim. Uh, there's his short story, The Body Snatchers, um, that gets into this whole thing of dual personalities and, and split personalities. And the science of the day was also interested in that. But Stevenson himself, I think, very much wanted to explore and, and perhaps puncture the Victorian hypocrisies. Um, and I think he felt that he himself was a hypocrite, that while he was supposed to be outwardly pursuing this career as an architect, et cetera, he really wanted to be an artist. And, and he had to reconcile those two parts of his personality um, in a way that, that allowed him to function. Um, so this was a deeply personal theme as well as a theme that he had thought about a good deal and, and and written about previously. Sure. And so, you know, to ask a bit more about theme, you know, you've done Dracula, Frankenstein, the Sherlock Holmes short stories, among many, many other books. What do you see as being the overarching themes? I mean, I know we have, you know, man and monster or man versus monster, um, the good of doctors versus the potential for badness there. So what do you see as connecting? those stories from that time period. Well, what connects them to me is the, as we said at the very beginning of the show, the iconic nature of these figures, that the figures, the central figures, whether it's Sherlock Holmes or Dracula himself or the creature or Victor Frankenstein um, or Jekyll, you know, they embodied um, perpetual problems, perpetual questions. Um, Sherlock Holmes is very much a, a question of how do we find justice in a society of laws, um, which are different things, justice and law. Uh, and do we, do we need, as Sherlock Holmes, to be a champion of justice as opposed to just a law enforcement person? Um, Frankenstein is very deep story about parenthood and the responsibilities of parenthood. Uh, Dracula is really an exploration of English society's reaction to outsiders, foreigners in particular, whether it's the Irish 
or the Eastern Europeans or whatever. So all of these great books took deep social problems, if you will, and, and instilled them into these figures that have stood out and lasted for hundreds of years. Um, and, and so, I mean, that's the connective tissue is that to me, it's not necessarily the same theme, they're not. But in each case, the figures have become so gigantic that they stand out head and shoulders above the rest of literature for the whole century uh, and even the 20th century. Um, I mean, are there a few figures in the 20th century that are those kind of figures? Yeah, perhaps. Um, I would suggest that Batman and Superman are among them um, as, as those kinds of sort of, what we say, larger than life, you know, uh, fictional, maybe. <laughs> um, you know, from the first half of the 20th century, I'm not sure there is anybody like that. There's certainly when you go back, you go to... Uh, Charlie Chaplin in a completely different medium. The Tramp is that kind of immortal figure. Don Quixote, another immortal figure. Um, it, it's it's hard to explain why these people come into existence, but they do, and we're richer for them. Absolutely. And so, of course, you know, you are very well read, obviously, and it is Halloween season, spooky season. Um, in addition to the books that you've already talked about, I'm wondering if you have any seasonal reading that you would recommend to people who are looking for a good scare. It could be classic, contemporary. Sure. I think you could go all night. <laughs> sure. Well, first of all, it would be remiss if I didn't plug uh, uh, the book that Lisa Morton and I just published called Haunted Tales, um, which came out in August. It's a collection of supernatural fiction from the 19th century largely, and I think you'll find that by and large, it's stories you don't know. Um, they are not strictly ghost stories. There are a wide variety of uh, supernatural stories because the supernatural fascinated the Victorians. Um, but I mean, it would certainly say Dracula, we've talked about Lovecraft. How can you, I mean, if you want to get the, you know, get your bodily fluids scared right out of you, read Lovecraft. Um, Lovecraft is one of those where, yeah, I'd heard for years about the influence of Lovecraft on so many other writers, but I hadn't sat down to read him until I did my annotated editions. Um, and wow, it is so powerful. Now, Lovecraft himself may not be the most, the nicest person. There's lots of issues with Lovecraft, but the stories will scare you immensely. And they're not... Um, spooky stories. They're not stories about ghosts. They're not stories about uh, particularly monsters. They're about the unknown uh, and uh, really powerful scares. I mean, obviously, there are many modern horror writers that are great. I'm, I'm just reading Stephen King's fairy tale right now and loving it. Uh, but there's another writer who was deeply influenced by Lovecraft, and uh, and says so right in the dedication of the book. Um, so there's lots of good stuff out there if you want to scare yourself for uh, for Halloween. Sure, and I guess you know, speaking of Stephen King, it would be an appropriate time to mention that this book actually has an introduction by Joe Hill. So it does indeed. Uh, and uh, Joe is a friend, and uh, he loves this. He loves this book. I don't mean my edition. He loves the story. And so it was very easy to talk him into writing the introduction. <laughs> Didn't have to twist that arm too hard. All no. Right. Final two questions. I ask this of pretty much everybody because there are always people out there, you know, looking for some words of encouragement or guidance when it comes to a writing life or a creative life. So in terms of living that life, what is the best advice that you were ever given? And then the flip side to that coin, the best advice that you were never given and had to learn for yourself throughout the process of actually doing it? Well, I think writers and journalists bring a different uh, mindset to writing than, um, than a lot of people who aren't in those categories. And that is, there's no such thing as writer's block. Um, you know, I can't tell a client, I'm sorry, I can't get to that memo. I have writer's block, you know, so you just do it. Um, 
excuse me for the, the coarse expression, but one of the greatest mantras I heard about being a writer is ass in chair. Yep. You just sit down and write. I mean, as we said before, writing is rewriting. So you're going to throw away a lot of the things that you write. You're going to rewrite it over and over again and, and all that. So the best advice that I ever got and that I pass along is just do it. Just sit down and write what you want to write and then finish it and go back to it. Rewrite it, edit it, show it to other people, listen hard to what they have to say, but do it. Don't just sit around thinking someday I'm going to be a writer. Sit down and do it. You're not a writer if you don't finish what you started. Sure. And is there is there anything in this journey that you've discovered discovered that nobody told you that you you know wish you knew then but you do know now? Well, I think I think the sad discovery for a lot of writers is that, and with all due respect to the wonderful publishers I've worked with, um, is that the publishers are going to do very little um, to market your book. Um, they're going to have salespeople out there, maybe, um, but they're not going to be booking interviews uh, with John Valeri to have you talk about the book. Uh, they're not going to be having setting you up to go to bookstores and go on book tours and things like that. You've got to do the marketing yourself. And this can be very disappointing. I, I had one friend who wrote a wonderful mystery novel. It was a success. His publisher loved it. It was a paperback, so it didn't sell millions of copies. But And they said to him, would you like to do another book? And he said, no. He said, I hated the marketing part. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for a lot of writers, that's a big surprise who think that you write the book and you send it off and you're done. No, <laughs> you have to then get out done. there. <laughs> right. You have to then get out there and talk to people about it. And it sounds crass and commercial to say market it. But you want if you want people to read your book, you have to be prepared to do that. Very true. I mean, there is just so much out there now and so many outlets through which to get it. Um, and another quick side note, but you reminded me when you were talking about writer's block and, you know, it's just, it's not a thing, you know, you just, you either write or you don't. Um, there's an episode of the Golden Girls, and I don't know if you've ever seen it, but where Blanche Devereaux decides that she's going to be one of the great Southern novelists. And, you know, she's toiling away thinking she's writing and she comes out and she says, girls, I have writer's block. It's the worst feeling in the world. And Dorothy says, well, how much have you written? And she says, that's just it. Nothing. That's how I know I have it. And Dorothy said, but Blanche, if that was the case, we'd all have writer's block. Right. But anyway, it's complete. Diversion. Yeah. Uh, but final question, I would assume, you know, that if I walked into your kitchen, many, many pots on the stove, you seem always to have things in the pipeline. So I'm wondering Absolutely. if you can tell us what we might expect next from you. Well, two different things that I would that I would talk about. One is um, a big book, and uh, um, Otto Penzler, the proprietor of Mysterious Press, and I have been talking about what might be next. Um, it's certainly not a commitment, but we've been talking about the Invisible Man. Um, mm -hmm. We'll see. Uh, but I'm also editing the Library of Congress Crime Classics series, which is kind of what it sounds like. Uh, these are American mystery classics in, in trade paperback editions. I would describe them as lightly annotated. We've been doing, we've already done 12, I think. I've, I've finished three more and we're sort of doing them one a quarter. So there's lots of books in the pipeline coming up are uh, just that very shortly. Um, Ed Lacey's Room to Swing, uh, Edgar winning uh, a PI novel from 1957. Uh, Dorothy Salisbury Davis's A Gentle Murderer, um, Gillette Burgess's Master of Mystery, um, The Thinking Machine by Jacques Futrell. I just finished S.S. Van Dyne's The Canary Murder Case. All of these are sort of in the pipeline and will be coming out in 2023 and on. Uh, this is a lovely series. The Library of Congress people are so wonderful to work with, um, and it's been a delight doing this series. So look for it. So is that all? <laughs> no, there's always other things. I've always got ideas for anthologies. Laurie King and I are talking about putting together another Sherlock Holmes related anthology mm. and so on. So I try I try and keep busy, John. Plus, I do have to practice law during the day, but uh, 
I, I am exhausted just contemplating all of this, you know, and knowing you have a day job and you, you know, do all of that. I mean, hey, I think it keeps you young and enthusiastic. So Absolutely. And it's all juggling. You know, yeah. it's all just sort of, yep. Uh, I mean, I, I was doing law work right up until we started our conversation. So. <laughs> I'll let you get back to law work. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for those many, many projects, people do have to go check out the new annotated strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, Leslie Klinger, this was a real delight. Thank you so much for taking the time. I am coveting the books behind you. You know, if I could zoom right into your office, I would. Thank you, John. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching. And be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.